Good afternoon, everybody. It's Wednesday, the 22nd of June. You're here at Lunch and Learn. Today, as you know, we have a guest speaker, uh, Dr. George Linfield. He's going to talk about uh, neurobiomodulation. Um, <clears throat> he works with V-Lite and similar systems and uh, has been working with this for quite some time. So he's going to give you sort of an overview of his work with it clinically. So without any further delay, George, thank you so much for uh, taking your time today. I know you're a busy guy uh, for talking to us, and the show is yours. Well, thank you for having me, and uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Let me preface by saying that I'm a user of uh, near-infrared light at uh, 82 years of age. I would like to keep my brain intact. So I average about uh, two administrations a week. They go for about 25 minutes each. Um, I use the uh, V-Lite cap as well as the intranasal unit. I also have an article in um, your journal that's on the use of infrared light. It's a case study and amazing results, I believe, with a veteran who used it on his own for three months, and he did it twice a day. This was the intranasal only that he used. Uh, this was the 810 uh, unit, which I think seems to be showing in research um, pretty decent results. At any rate, I'm going to spend part of this discussion with infrared, i.e. photobiomodulation, as you see on the screen. But my primary expertise is in the area of binaural sound. So I would like to give you some brief overview about what that can uh, provide for you as well. I've got a PowerPoint and uh, we're going to proceed on that. This is the intranasal unit. Unfortunately, it's not quite as clear as I'd like, but you could see that a uh, piece at one end of the wire clips onto the nose. And I tell you, when you clip it on, it's a little bit annoying. Uh, it's battery driven. And the good deal about this is that it's relatively passive. And this is the same case when you're using the cap. You can be reading, you can be watching TV. Um, you're really not having to sit there silently um, or do anything. That light is penetrating into the under part of the brain and delivering energy to it. And I want to preface this by taking you back a step to evolution. I understand many of you are using V-Lite, so this may not be new to you. But think about it, how a plant energizes. The sun hits the uh, surface, producing chlorophyll, which then energizes that plant. So if we are creatures of evolution, one would think that there would be part of our cell that might respond to light as well. And indeed, you will see as we proceed, this is the case. So here are the wavelengths of light. And we're looking in the infrared range. We'll break that down further. And this takes us to near infrared, and you'll see the 800 marker there. And indeed, the unit I use is 810. So among many of the factors that this light produces is increased circulation, which is a very interesting concept. Um, Think of all the things that might result in to enhance the circul circulation in your patient or in, her, in yourself. Here is a visual of it. 
you see how it's clipped on the nose. This is the type of unit I have, uh, the cap. It's a little awkward to get on, and I'm not bald, but for the most part, that light can pass through hair and into the scalp, as you see in that uh, figure 1D in those varied locations, energizing cellular activity. And here's an even greater close-up of that. I'm moving along quite quickly. Now, as opposed to chlorophyll, we're looking at microchondrion in the cellular activity as the means through which energy is produced. And here we're talking about this ATP factor. Now, in the introduction to this are listed all of the dis different positive aspects of what energizing the cell um, produces. And I won't go over that in any detail. I think this is the last one on this. Oh, here we go. Take a read of that. ADP converted through absorbing red and infrared. Microchondrion are present in nearly every cell. They provide everything. Energizing this uh, cell and acting as the body's molecular batteries. Again, I believe this is the completion of this series. So any questions, please? Yes, which, which headpiece do you use, the gamma or alpha? I'm using the gamma. Thanks. Uh, can, can you just clarify that? Is that gamma in the nose? You're using, it's, can it's you use both the system, at the same time? It's how the system uh, is devised. So my cap and intranasal are gamma units. Now, let me preface one important piece of information that you need to know. When you stop using this with, let me say, your patient, they are going to reverse in the progress they've made. Uh, that's really the only negative that I'm aware of. Uh, so this has to be a consistent ongoing process. If you look up infrared and YouTube, uh, on YouTube, infrared and Alzheimer's, you will see amazing changes in patients that are let us say non-responsive to where they become communicative. So this is a passive treatment. It's best if the patient uh, can afford one on their own, but that's not often the case. If they need to come in for an office visit, I think you're speaking to uh, at least twice a week type of intervention. Any other questions? Can you talk about why you pick gamma over alpha? Not really. Um, I am not an expert in this, I will openly acknowledge, but I think you can contact the VLIDE people to get clarification of that. I just think it uh, gives a more powerful output is my speculation. Okay. Anybody else? And then we're going to sound. Okay. Okay, so let me get rid of this. And is anybody out there using binaural sound?
No, um, some of us no. Well, some of us, uh, George, who use um, there's a company up in Canada called Mind Alive. Uh, Dave Seaver is the owner and operator and develops his equipment. And <clears throat> when you get one of his um, his uh, his units, which uh, uses light, you know, in the eyes, you can do it eyes open or eyes closed, along with the um, light, you know. You get um, a headset and there's binaural beats that you can use with the uh, photic, you know, light uh, yes. to enhance activity or you can use something different. You don't, you don't have to use it. You can put plug in music instead. So many of us are aware of that. And just an answer to the previous question somebody asked you, if it's my understanding is correct, the nasal unit does not generate um, gamma or alpha. The nasal unit is just pure infrared light, while it the is, head units is are... Is it both? Okay. It's pulsed. It's pulsed. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. So I take it what I'm going to present is not familiar to almost all of you. Um, I've developed what I want to call reset therapy, and that stands for reconsolidation enhancement by stimulation of emotional triggers. The effects of trauma, and I'm talking emotional trauma. This is not TBI. By the way, you can use that infrared for TBI. You can use it for Alzheimer's or other forms of dementing disorder, uh, very types of cognitive impairment as well. Uh, some folks are talking about using the light to reduce anxiety and depression as well. I'm not familiar with that. But here are the effects of emotional trauma on the brain in the different regions. In effect, we go into the primitive fight, flight, or freeze mode. You're going to be seeing a case study example as well as a pilot study. This is Wade, um, soldier, and one who experienced PTSD. He was asked to activate the trauma he experienced, which, uh, as I recall, was a plane crash where he was and others were preparing to enter planes in anticipation of a parachute drop. And uh, this happened uh, in uh, North Carolina, I understand, with multiple, multiple uh, injuries. Well, this traumatized this fellow. He also had other events, but we did a QEEG before proceeding with any treatment. And here you're actually seeing the brainwave activity as part of the process where the arrows are, that material which may have been an eye blink, uh, biting down on the jaw or a head movement, they're removed first so that we get at least, I believe it's 30 seconds of clean material, 30 to 60 seconds. Here is his brain map results. Are all of you folks, I have to assume, but that doesn't make sense, familiar with brain maps? Yes. Okay. And you'll notice this fellow is damaged. Red, of course, is uh, heightened levels. Uh, the green is normative. This is his pre Imaging and sensing, that's an important part in this treatment. 
So you want to get out of thinking and you want to get into the visceral sensation of the experience. I'll read this to you as a trial to ensure that the settings, well, I can't see some of that. Disruptor signal was run for five silent minutes. Then Wade was asked to revisit the triggering event once more. So the disruptor signal is the frequencies, the sound frequencies, two of them that were set. The primary frequency and then the offset frequency. Now, in my methodology, I tune specifically into the trauma circuit in the brain. So I'm not just randomly uh, utilizing a pre-setting. If you get a, a binaural sound tape, you're not going to get a lot of variation, or it's not going to be specifically focused to the individual that's receiving it. I want it to be targeted into the cortical circuitry that's involved in sustaining the trauma memory. So after Wade was asked to revisit the triggering event once more, he reported having trouble getting there. And these are his words. It's kind of foggy. It's like there's a cloud in my way. It's just pieces now. It's really fuzzy. It's kind of strange. At this point, the session was over. Now, mind you, this was five minutes. This is his post QEG. That's quite a difference. What you see remaining is a consequence of a TBI incident he had. And basically, his PTSD signature is not there anymore. Any questions? I'll move on. Uh, <laughs> George, uh, yeah, go, you go ahead. The other person I spoke once. Um, well, I did too. <laughs> um, what? How did you select the frequency? I'll get to that. And that's a good question, by the way. This is his Loretta imagery at 28 hertz. This is uh, pre, pre-treatment, and this is post. So folks, it looks to me like something happened in the brain. The blue is hypoarousal, and it's perceived that that normalizes fairly rapidly over time. So here's the primary hypothesis. In some, not everyone, trauma alters neuronal circuitry. This change affects both the mind, body, and I can't see that. So. So. Altered circuitry places one in a chronic. Read that to me, please. You know, I think I'm going to shrink this thing here. Chronic protect. And There's two state. little white arrows there. there. there oh, John, you got it? Okay, good. Where are the arrows? What I was mm -hmm. saying is on the window for go to meeting to minimize that there's little two little white arrows that face each other. When you click those, it pushes that to the side, or you can hit the orange arrow to push it to the side. <clears throat> and, I, see. Uh, I got it. Okay, there we there go. There you go. Perfect. That helps. Altered circuitry places one in a chronic protect and defend state. In other words, I showed you where trauma affects the brain. And in that frontal lobe region where executive functioning is happening, that is rather deactivated. So your PTSD trauma veteran or combat veteran, when they are in the altered state, they are back in combat. 
This condition is associated with a neuroinflammatory state that has long-term deleterious effects. And that uh, neuroinflammatory is an important aspect to be well aware of. Oh, I just brought this back up. Okay, I'm going to do enter. Now, why aren't I getting my... Oh, my. Come on, there we go. Okay, so let's talk about binaural beats. Now, this has been around for a long time, folks. 5,000 years ago, think about the uh, Tibetan bowls where you run something around the bowl and it produces that sound. I'm sure most of you have heard that. It seems to have a binaural aspect in the way we hear it. So let's look at this. Here's the headphones. And on one side, we've got 114 hertz. That's the tone in the right ear. And we're setting the tone in the left ear to 124 hertz. The difference is 10 hertz. That's the binaural beat. Often, the one that's selected ends up in the theta range, interestingly. I'm not talking yet about how you get there. I'm just giving you a little overview of what this binaural aspect is. Let's talk about memory now. I've indicated that uh, in the term reset, we are talking about reconsolidation. So let me briefly speak about that. When something occurs, particularly of the magnitude of trauma, mm -hmm. it becomes consolidated and locked into a region of the hippocampus and is stored in there. I conceive of it as a vault. Things can trigger that memory. Over time, Typical memories, not trauma per se, tend to modify, as evidenced in the research of um, witnesses. Their story changes. So each time that story comes up for that witness, it might slightly alter to where six months later, major pieces of it don't sound the same. However, with trauma, I don't think there's much consolidation. When the person is triggered, the visceral response is pretty much a constant. So we go into stored memory, and I mentioned that's in the hippocampus. It's retrieved, and when it's retrieved, the amygdala helps to activate, gives that warning. Oh boy, look out, here we go again. It becomes activated. Now look at the arrow, modification by reset. I believe that the circuitry changes and the emotional piece drops out. It becomes reconsolidated and now the memory becomes altered. I have my patients try to be as stress-free as they can after we've dealt with a major uh, target for at least four hours. I don't want them going home having an argument with the spouse. I don't want them walking into a stress-related situation such as at work. I want them to be at peace for that period while their brain restores altered memory. Again, I'm open to questions if you have them at this point. Good, moving on.
But George, that's very important what you just said. So I'm just waiting for it to sink in. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, yeah. Now I'm proposing to you, you folks in neurofeedback, and I'm estimating that it takes you maybe upwards of 20 to 30 sessions to get what I can achieve in maybe two to four. Now, of course, this is dependent on your patient. So yesterday I saw a patient, uh, he's a psychologist, works for the VA, that is hypersensitive. And I wanna go much slower with him. So it's important that you pick up info from your patient as to the pace you're gonna proceed with. Here I show you a pilot study. By the way, all of this was done pro bono by myself and colleagues. A number of published articles on this. Um, the blue is the CAPS-5, and this is not the um, checkoff list. This is the actual interview. It takes, what, upwards of 45 minutes at least. Look at the change in scores. Four sessions was the total provided. Most of these folks achieved their changes within the first two sessions. Now, I know that sounds wild, and I ask my combat vets to be skeptical, and I ask you to do the same. But we're going, here's V2 on the left, from a cap score of 52 down to five. Look at GW2 from 77 to 1. Please take a minute to digest this. I point out that IA2 still fell within the PTSD range, which is, let's say, from 32 to 34 on the CAP score. And this person had a pretty severe co-traumatic um, brain injury. Any questions on what you see? Nobody's saying wow. That is incredible. I just did a CAPS on a uh, traumatized client last week and his score was 54 or 59 mm -hmm. so when you're moving and i'm looking at dreams and memory and nightmares and night sweats and sleeping issues and relationship issues his score was super high and to move from a 52 down to a five in two sessions is quite frankly beyond belief well i told you to be skeptical and uh, I invite you to learn more about this. I don't think there's any other pilot studies results I've seen that even approaches this. Neuropsych questionnaire. Look at the average scores. I point out to you pain. So this has an effect on pain levels. Not that much, but some. Look at sleep. Look at suicide. I would propose to you that binaural sound can alleviate neuroinflammation and reset the trauma circuit back to its prior level, thereby establishing previous resiliency. Everybody done looking at this? Can you receive a question at this point? Oh, yeah, anytime. 
Have you applied this to clients who present with functional neurological disorder or conversion disorder? And if so, have you had any results that are positive? They seem to be lost in the medical world. I, I'm trying to review my memory. I don't believe I have done any, any with specific conversion disorders. Okay, thank you. I am working with a multiple personality um, with some positive results. I guess we don't call them multiples anymore, right? That's the old term. Right, it's called DID now, dissociative. Yeah, dissociative ID. disorder. I am developing an app at this point for the iPhone. I call it myself and my colleague, Resolve It. Why is this important? To buy a BOD, you are putting out $500. Resolve It is going to be available through the Apple Store for around $25 a month, which means you can use it for as long as you need it. And if you don't need it, you can discontinue. And if a year from this point you need it again, you can use it. So who could benefit from this? People with impulse control, where they can target this and learn to alter their impulsive nature. People with trauma can be instructed, I call it coaching, in how to self-administer resolve to be able to address any underlying experiences that break through. I recommend they continue to have a coach available, however, when they need it. Uh, some people with minor type issues, I think they can handle this pretty much on their own. It's going to look something like this on the iPhone. You're going to see the vo volume dials up top, and you're going to see the frequency dials down the bottom. At this point, I'm going to tell you how I go about doing it. First of all, I let the patient activate the trigger, as I call it, so that they are sensing it as opposed to thinking about it, i.e., I want them to locate it in their body. I will use a SUDS rating of 0 to 10. I would like them to activate in the range of perhaps four to six. I don't want it to overwhelm them at first. When that happens, I will ask them to move the resonant frequency dial to the point that it seems to connect with that sensory experience. When they believe they've got that, I will then ask them to go to the release frequency. Now, mind you, the resonant frequency is not going to relieve anything. It's simply connecting to the um, trauma experience. Now, both the BOD, Bioacoustical Utilization Device, that's the $500 number, and the uh, iPhone, resolve it, use what's called a square D sound wave. It's irritating. It sounds like buzzing bees to some extent. Its purpose is to activate the amygdala, to further energize the trauma memory. The next step in the process is to ask the patient to uh, move the release frequency, which has a range of about 20 hertz. So it'll go from 200 to 220 
in this case you see right here. I asked them to move it to the point that they perceive that there's some diminishment in that intensity. So that's phase one. Now, phase two, I'm going to share with you for the first time because I'm kind of sensitive about this. It's a little on the hokey side. I talk to them about Mikey, and I tell them Mikey is the inner person that was there before they could speak, and it, that Mikey is more powerful than they are. And for those of you that are youngsters, I'm talking about Mikey in the serial ad. You can see it on YouTube, where the two brothers are having Mikey test the serial to see how he responds before they try it. How many of you have heard of Mikey? Wow. I have. Okay. I have. Well, okay, a couple. <laughs> At any rate, I refer to Mikey as the subconscious. And since the subconscious is the part that I believe that activates the trigger, I want the subconscious to come on board and provide assistance to my patient. I want there to be a union between my patient and Mikey. And Mikey can be a female name too, by the way so that they help each other, assist each other, and protect each other. And I'm going to ask that Mikey, uh, here we go, that Mikey move a pendulum that is held in the left hand at approximately 30 degrees, and it's braced on an armchair or the edge of a couch, that Mikey move the pendulum when the frequency the resonant frequency really connects with the boo-boo. Because I think Mikey's about three years old, three to five. And when that pendulum moves, and I'll give him different ways to test it out, to see it and experience it, then I'm going to ask Mikey to move the release frequency next. More often than not, these settings are not the same as that which the conscious individual provided me. That's how I establish the settings. Well, I think Let me just say, uh, go, go ahead for somebody. I was just going to say, uh, George, I just think everybody's um, kind of surprised at what you're presenting. So uh, they're trying to wrap their minds around it. It's uh, pretty well, radical. You, you guys can ask me questions too, if you like. Again, I don't believe there's any set sound, although I must tell you with the BOD, when I use it on two and two, that has a very calming effect. And I've used it on tra traumatized animals to calm them down. What do you that's, think of that? That's good because there's no... Uh, placebo effect there. So that that gets your attention, definitely. Right. Now, in the app, at 26 hertz, that approximates the sound of a purring cat. So I believe when the app comes out, that will have the same effect as the two and two setting on the board. But those would be the only fixed ones that I would tell you about. Now, I can tell you, George, having read something recently, I'm going to try to find it. I'll put it on our list there of that. Um, one of the most soothing things for a human being is the frequency that a cat purrs at. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just saw that in the scientific article. Yeah, okay. Yep, you saw probably the same one I saw. So that's yep. sort of nice and impressive too. <laughs> yeah. And I have two cats, so I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you folks must really be stuck here. Is there any follow-up like on a longer term for the the eight uh veterans to see like if these symptom reductions have been maintained? 
I've had one individual out of that eight have a setback because of a new trauma. And I invited him to use the sound again, but he chose to use VA services. God bless him, I don't understand why. I don't think that exposure therapy is the way to go, personally. Although I must tell you that Reset, if you will, uses a form of exposure therapy, doesn't it? When you're asking the person yes. to activate the trauma. Yep, you are. Now, what are the benefits of this for the therapist? I think you avoid the possibility of developing secondary PTSD because you're not exposed to trauma material. And I think over time, the average therapist is going to be exposed. I believe the same effect happens with our first responders. But God bless me, I can't seem to break through to get a police group or whatever have you to consider using this. So if you folks have those kind of connections, that would be a fantastic research effort. I am also looking and still struggling here in Asheville, North Carolina, beautiful day today, to be able to set up a case study for someone with chronic homelessness. And I believe these people fight the same war as the combat veteran does, but they never get to leave the jungle. So if you want to reintegrate this population into society, why not do some reset of brain circuitry? <clears throat> now, mind you, often these people are traumatized early in their life. By the way, I have read a study not too long ago that the preponderance of combat veterans that develop PTSD also have experienced trauma in their life as evidence through their ACE score, Adverse Childhood Experiences. So those of you that have those kind of connections and you want to be a co-author, hey, I'm here. George, uh, would it be appropriate for you to share a little bit about your background and how you stumbled upon this? Uh, because intuitively, it's clear that what you say is is true. Some of the definitions, I think, would be helpful if we could clarify and try and fit it into a uh, some theoretical framework, whether, depending on where we, we come from, for example, I've been steeped in uh, polyvagal theory for the past few weeks, so so I've got that mindset, and I'm I got a lot of questions that I don't want to monopolize your time with in trying to figure out how we move from the hypothalamic to the reset in the cortical area, and and um, a lot of things boil down to trying to clarify <clears throat> exactly uh, what the terms of the definitions are in terms of uh, trauma and and when trauma starts, if not coming down the birth canal that Otto Rung spoke about, the trauma of birth. Uh, but I think well, what's relevant in our life as therapists is that we're getting traumatized when we're hearing stories and we're empathizing with people who have been deeply, deeply wounded. And this injury, whether it's a moral injury, a hardcore TBI, that injury has a similar effect on the circuitry in the brain. So we, we're always dealing with it and we, <clears throat> you know, we want to protect ourselves from getting re-traumatized in the work that we're doing. Yeah, uh, I think that it has a cumulative effect. So you're a police officer, you've been psychologically screened for your position, you're healthy as all get out. And that's the end of it. They don't recheck you five years later, 10 years later, 20 years later. You see dead babies, you see this, you see that. It has a cumulative effect. And what do you do with your buddies? You drink, and that's how you deal with it. I'm saying there's other alternatives, 
you want my background, I'm going to give you some. I'm 82 years old. I'm uh, third generation. My grandfather came from Hungary to avoid being drafted. Um, I tried to ask him about his family, and his face would turn ashen white, and he would walk away from me. I didn't understand it. That was PTSD. Uh, around my 13th year, probably late 12th year of life, um, one of my aunts died tragically in a car accident. There were two couples honeymooning down in Mexico. They went over a cliff. And this was before my special Jewish event called the Bar Mitzvah. That impacted me. I wasn't good in school, uh, C's, B's. I thought I was going to be a cabinet maker, <clears throat> except the cabinet maker they placed me with went bankrupt, so I sat in study halls. I joined the Navy Seabees, and I quickly learned how to swing a pick into coral. It would bounce back at me, and I thought, George, you know, this is not the thing for you. So I decided to go to school, and I became a shop teacher, industrial arts teacher, because I was familiar with tools. The other teachers would put all these troubled kids in my class. So I decided I'm going to learn something. I became a school psychologist. About that time, New York decided you have to be a doctorate to be able to be in charge. And I've got an attitude, so I decided, damn it, I don't want to work for anyone else at this point. I'm going to get my doctorate. And then I went ahead and did my postdoc at the University of Oregon Medical School in medical psychology. So that's my story. I've always been interested in PTSD and trauma. My daughter introduced me to the BOD. This has been about 15 years now. She attended a workshop and saw it there. And I took to it like a fish to water. Um, brief synopsis. I can't give you a lot of terms, but you can certainly look into it. I mean, we're kind of limited for time. But other questions, if you will. Thank you for sharing. This, this um, model that you've created, it, is this a combination of neurofeedback and binaural rhythms? Uh, I guess I could roughly say yes, but I don't think of it in that way. I think that I'm going into the memory vault the hippocampus, I'm unlocking it with that second aspect of the binaural sound. I'm activating a memory in there. I'm pulling out the emotional charge and then putting it back in the vault to restore. So I'm thinking more in consolidation terms in my mind. Now, here's my general hit rate. 50% tend to get immediate results. Another 30%, they get something in 24 hours. Perhaps 20%, it takes time. Uh, they may be disconnected, if you will. That's one of the uh, neurolinguistic groups disconnected or disassociated, and they will take some other priming before they're able to respond. But I don't think an 80% or, uh, yeah, 80% hit rate isn't too bad with this uh, intervention. Other thoughts or questions? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, George, my name is Maurice. Um, this is quite impressive, and I want to mention two things. One, um, what you described reminds me of a uh, process that's not neurofeedback, 
uh, driven nor uh, binaural driven, but essentially tackles um, this reconsolidation aspect that you described yes. uh, uh, quite well. Uh, are you familiar with MAP, uh, a process called MAP? Describe it to me, please. Um, so this is something that was developed by uh, a therapist named Colette Stryker uh, in collaboration with George Flint uh, over in Canada, who did extensive work in uh, trauma, you know, trauma therapy, deeply tra worked with deeply, deeply traumatized um, individuals. And uh, they built in or they built on a discovery from about 10 years ago. I'll try and find the paper and share it with um, uh, Dr. S so he can pass it uh, to the community. Yeah, That'd be great. Uh, I, I'm not familiar to answer you. I thought you were referring to Bruce Eckert, who has developed this uh, consolidation, reconsolidation process around the year 2000. So this has not been around a long time, really. Yeah, so this is this is new. Well, without taking too much time, I just want to mention one that the results you're you're showing um, are congruent with the results I've seen uh, in connection with this process, and this process is now being studied uh, by uh, folks associated with um, well, I won't name names, but some some folks in the in the trauma community as well as uh, some uh, folks who've done a lot of work in uh, neurofeedback, but from mm -hmm. the angle of, of uh, peak performance. And one of the key aspects, Mikey, that you, uh, the, the language you use with Mikey, yeah. for instance, they refer to uh, the superconscious. And someone on the call, you know, asked about definitions. This is one of the challenges, of course, you know, the definitions will, uh, will help, but it can also confuse people. But what this process does is leveraging what they refer to the uh, to the superconscious to essentially activate without uh, bringing a charge the emotional charge just like you're doing with the vets allowing yeah. allowing the memory uh to reconsolidate while removing the charge and that's the key thing and this can be done very quickly yeah i think there's many paths to rome um there are a number of ways people use tapping, for example, the physical therapist. Mm -hmm. now, psychologists, our ethics say you don't touch. So I want to use um, sound. And by the way, I need to add that reset, if you will, is a nonverbal intervention. Once you've explained to the patient what the process is, you use verbal intervention after because they are, if you will, detoxified. I'm not going to catch the poison is what I'm thinking. Yeah, I think we just lost you, George. Oh, what do I have to do? You're good. You're back. You're back. Oh, I, I didn't do anything. How are we doing for time? We're out of We're, time. We're out of time. <laughs> We're fast. We're done. Okay. Yeah, we all have appointments, and unfortunately, we have to go take care of those appointments. Uh, this has been fascinating, George, um, and uh, uh, exciting, and we really look forward to uh, uh, the further developments on it. And again, those of you who um, want to read more about it george has uh posted a paper on it on uh new mind journal that's that's the letter n and then the word mind nmindjournal.com you can go up there and and uh, read it in detail well i i thank you for having me it's been a pleasure and i look forward to anyone that wants to pursue this further do you have a Thank website? Uh, yeah, let me give you my email address. I think that would be the easiest. It's okay. Gil okay. Do you have that out there already? I can, I can post it for you on the list, sir, for those that want to contact you. How's that? Yeah, it's it's glindy, G-L-I-N-D-Y, 123, at gmail.com.
Okay, there we go. Well, we all have to sign off now. I know I'm late for my appointment, so I hope uh, you all enjoyed. Well, I kept you five minutes thank after, you. so thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Much appreciated. Take care, everybody. Thank we'll you. see you Friday. Bye-bye.